Welcome everyone to Hello World from Scratch, the longest talk about Hello World you'll have seen unless you were at our AccuConf talk earlier this year. Uh, I'm Sai. I work at Microsoft as their C++ developer advocate. I'm Peter Biddles. I'm a, a principal software engineer. And we've had to cut this, down, this talk down a lot because the last time we had an hour and a half and it didn't fit. And this time we have an hour. So bear with us. We might go a bit fast. So this is a fairly famous quote from Carl Sagan. If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. It sounds very profound. And when you think about it, it actually means a lot because when you want to make something from scratch, there's a lot of complexity in that that you haven't realized is actually there. Because an apple pie sounds so simple. It's just take some apples from a tree. But the tree has to come from somewhere. And the somewhere it came from has to comply with physics. It has to do with gravity. There's so many things of complexity in something so simple as an apple pie. So in this talk, we're going to do Hello World, which is a really complicated application that many of you may have written. So we're going to start with Hello World in C, which is the simpler version of the two. And we'll continue with Hello World in C++, which is a bit more complicated. But we'll show you can manage. So Hello World in C. Who here has written Hello World in C? That's nearly everybody. So that's good. You'll all know what this is going to be about. We have Hello World in C. We have an int main. We call a function called puts, because we didn't want to get into printf complexity. It puts Hello World, and then it ends. We include a header for puts, so that's all. And this is how people understand how a compiler works. We have source file. Something happens. We end up with an executable, and the executable runs and prints Hello World. But of course, this, this thing that happens, it's just it's magic. Sparkly magic. <laughs> but it's not just magic. There's, there's rhyme and reason to it. So if you take it down to its component steps, we actually have translation. And translation starts with having a lexer. No, oh, not a lexer. Yeah, so translation is a process made up of several steps, each of which we're going to go through in this talk. So we start off with our source file. And instead of just a big black box of magic, we have these steps before we end up at the executable. So we're going to go through all of these in turn. We'll take a few passes, because some are a bit more complicated than others. But we're going to start off with the preprocessor here. So before we get into the compiler, we are in preprocessor land. We have a source file, and we want to output preprocessed source. So we have a preprocessor, and it does a couple of things. It, for example, has a simple statement, which is define. It defines a macro. And in this case, it defines x to be transformed to y. So any x in our source code will be transformed to a y. We can make it a slight bit more complicated by making a macro function, which takes x with an argument and transforms it into a y, which may or may not use that argument anywhere. And we can use this to do substitutions. For example, we can call x with array n comma, uh, n comma 4. And this already shows one of the big downsides of macros. They don't understand our code. They just look at this like a bunch of bytes. So they're going to read this and see a comma. And that comma says this is the second argument, because of course this is not just one thing. This is two parts. And then it's going to complain that we're passing two arguments to a macro taking one. Yep, so the important thing to note here is we are not really in the land of C and C++ at this stage. This is, this is something a little bit different. This is just working with tokens, with text. It doesn't understand what we're talking about when we say array in comma 4. OK, this is before compilation. But we can do more things with just a define. We can check if it's defined, which means that if you're in this room right now looking at us giving a talk, you're looking at our slides. And our slides are if def for cppcon. So if you're here in the room, we'll take the bottom puts and say, hello, CPCon 2019. But if you're looking at our slides at home and downloaded them offline, it will have a different result from that if def. In theory. <laughs> yeah, we'll upload the slides later. Yeah. There's a third thing it can do. We can take another file and just include it. Wholesale, take that other file, put it in place as an include statement, and just keep expanding everything until we have a giant source file filled with statements that are not includes anymore. And all of this is still done in the text level. So we just include text as text. And all the interpretations of what the text may mean depends on all the macros before it. Yeah, so at this stage, we're still at the level of source. We have, we've done some pre-processing, but it's still 
our source language is just text. Okay, we haven't done any real like understanding or analysis of what this program is yet. And that is what the compiler does. So the compiler itself is one of the most complicated programs which people reasonably write. Um, I mean, you can make a very simple compiler. I had a talk earlier this year where I wrote one on stage in an hour, but you can also spend like years and years and years and years and years making one as fast and performant and just as good as possible. So to do this talk, we're going to explain a little bit more detail what a compiler actually does. So we'll take the compiler block, enlarge it a bit, and go into detail. And the compiler is made up, uh, made up of a front end, a middle end, and a back end, which sounds like a really arbitrary way of pl splitting it up. But that's rhyme to the, uh, rhyme to the, uh, to the madness. We have a front end which takes our code in text form and it transforms it into intermediate representation. And the intermediate representation is a sort of portable format. The middle end takes the IR that we have and transforms it into an equivalent but better IR. So we call it optimized IR. And the back end takes the optimized IR and outputs in it into basically assembly, up to the point where our uh, CPU would almost be able to understand it. Yep, so we're, we're going to go into more detail about all of these different steps later on. But for now, we have compilers made up of front end, middle end, back end. OK. So going on to the assembler, we now, through some magic which we're going to explain later, uh, translated our preprocessed source into our assembly. And now we need to produce an object file from this. Now, some compilers will kind of merge these steps and not output assembly, they'll just output object code directly. But this is this helps in understanding, so we're going to do it this way. So instruction encoding. So if you're used to, to writing or reading assembly, you might be used to, to this kind of thing. You, know, you have an add with some operands, and you can read it like it's text. If you can read text then, or you have a screen reader or something, then you can understand what this is saying. Um, but this is not something which the machine can just arbitrarily execute. We need to encode this in some uh, binary fashion, and that's what instruction encoding is. So this is the instruction encoding for MIPS, which we chose because it's like actually used, but also pretty simple. You do not want to see what the x64 version of this graph looks like. Um, so MIPS, it just has an opcode for you know, what kind of thing we want to do, then some operands, and then it has some extra things if you're doing shift operations or to select um, which kind of uh, like arithmetic instruction you want or something like that. So it just so happens that these are the magic numbers which make up the add instruction with these particular registers. And if we encode these in binary, this is just like taking these numbers and translating to binary. This is not any magic. And then if we just you know, make it look a bit more binary-ish, this is an instruction. This is the binary encoding of that MIPS instruction. And that could now be executed. Uh, we also have assembler directives, which are not instructions which are going to run when the program we eventually output is run. These are things which tell the assembler to do something, like. Uh, make some space because I'm going to put some data in this section of my binary, uh, or put a string here. So this, for this example, that's make four bytes of space and align it to four bytes. Uh, it's just to the power of two for a line for some reason. And then the data dot data directive says I want to put this in the data section of my object file. If you don't want an object file, is don't worry. And the dot text directive says, I want to put my code now in the dot text section. And when we're talking about these sections, for the purposes of this talk, we're going to talk about ELF. Uh, ELF is the executable and linkable format, which sounds really generic. Uh, we chose this because it's available on Linux, which is a relatively available operating system. And it's a fairly straightforward format. There is also a format for uh, OS X, which is called Mac O. And there's a format for Windows, which is called Portable Executable, which are as generic as this one. And both of those have a little bit more quirks and a little bit more complications than this one. So this is easier to explain. An ELF file starts with just a header explaining what kind of ELF file it is, for what kind of CPU, what kind of environment it is, what kind of file it is. Is this an optic file, a core file, an executable? 
and then it contains the rest of the parts of the file that are necessary for that kind of file. So in case of an executable, we have a program header, and then we have the code beneath it to run. And there are four kinds of object files, or four kinds of ELF files. So we have an object file, which is what your assembler outputs for your compiler, to, uh, for your linker to take. We have an executable, which is what your linker makes out of a bunch of object files. We have a shared library, which is equivalently what your compiler can make out of a set of object files, but it's not a whole program. And you have a core dump, which is what your program turns into as soon as it crashes. <laughs> but it's still in the same file format. So if you can read L files, you can read the core dump just as you can read an executable. Yep, so that's all we're going to talk about assembly, the assembler for now, moving on to the linker. So at this stage, um, we likely have more than one object file. So although this is kind of linear, uh, you can imagine that there are you know, a bunch of different source files and they've all gone through this process of getting lowered to an object file. And now we need to bundle these all together and link them into a final executable. So that brings us to a linker, which sounds like a really complicated thing, but honestly, writing a linker can be done in less than 2,000 lines of code and produce runnable executables on your own system. What a linker does is take all the object files that you pass it, find all the symbols in there, and create a lookup table of all the symbols that are defined and referenced. And for the ones that it cannot find yet, it tries to find it in the libraries you passed in. And if it finds one, it loads that object file as well, add it to the set of things that were defined, import the new set of things that are not defined, repeat until we have all of them. And at that point, we have an entire executable. We set all the relocations that point to something that doesn't exist to the location it ended up at, and we output that into an executable file. Yep, so we're gonna talk about the linker in a bit more detail and have an actual example of you know, having a bunch of bytes and how does this bunch of bytes end up getting um, made into something we can execute. Um, so that's gonna come a bit later. We're gonna take you through the entire compiler with the Hello World program. Yep, so expanding the compiler out again, we had the front end, middle end, back end. Now it turns out front ends are also complicated. So we can expand this out. So these are the main stages of a front end of a compiler. So again, we're taking in our pre-processed source and we want to get down to our intermediate representation. So the main stages here are lexing, parsing, semantic analysis, and code generation. Um, you might not understand what these kind of like intermediate forms are yet, so we're gonna run through examples. So we start off with a lexer. Say we have our Hello World program, and we want to understand what this text means. We, we have a source language, which is C. We have like a definition for what C is. So how do we understand what this program is trying to say? Um, if we're trying to interpret the text, then we have to deal with a lot of really nasty things like white space, like identifiers or strings, punctuation. Uh, these are all things which make it difficult for computers to process um, this program. So what we first do is take our text and translate it into a linear series of tokens, which is a lot easier to process. So as an example, we have our int, and that's an identifier. We then recognize we have main, and that's also an identifier. Then we have a left parenthesis, and then so on and so forth until we get a linear sequence of tokens which describes this text. So notice that this entire list of tokens is the same thing no matter what kind of code formatting you're using. So at this point, our compiler has an understanding of what the code actually says and doesn't read the source file anymore. At this point, it knows these are the tokens that are meant to come out of this. Does anyone have any questions on that? Because this is important. Cool. Oh, sorry, question, yes, at the back. The, the question generate was... generate a sequence of tokens, and a token is something that is, it's still just a sequence, but it's a sequence of things that the compiler then understands as, uh, say, an int instead of seeing just individual letters. Yep. So it's just a slightly higher representation of your text, but it's not at the level yet that we have a grammar or anything uh, that we can see as a tree. Yep. So the question was, is this like creating a grammar? And no, and we will get into grammars very shortly. Yes, other question? So we have all the old cases of putting angles in things being ambiguously. <laughs> 
If I we hope have a no one would ask this clock, question. We'll do that. Yeah. So, yeah. So the question was, do we have to deal with things which are, you know, like um, if we have two closing angle brackets, does this mean it's like a, temp a close of a template instantiation, or does this mean it's an operator? And yes, in something like C++, it's a lot more complicated. You have to like interleave a lot of these stages. But that's more complicated. Come speak to us afterwards if you want to understand more about that. So Lexer is, um, if we want to actually implement a Lexer, then say we want to recognize the tokens AB and AC. You can look at this as a finite state automata, where we have some initial state. And if we read an A, we go into the A state. And if we read a B or a C, then we go into one of the two other ones. And of course, if you read something else, you go into some error state. So there are a few ways which we could implement this in code. One is by just having a switch statement. You know, we can say, if, it's an, if we got an A, then read something else. If we get B, then it's this, C, that. And this looks like pretty rudimentary, like we're just writing a switch statement which encodes all the different states. But for a simple language, this is actually quite a reasonable way to write a lexer, because uh, it's quite understandable. We can see exactly what's going on. There's no magic or additional tooling. It's just C++. We can go for a more automated approach by using a, a lexer generator. And they take an input that looks a bit like this. So we have a statement that says that there's an AB token that we want to recognize. And in that case, we return token AB. There's an AC token we recognize, we return token AC. This is a higher level representation of it, and it will generate a really efficient lexer for us. And if you go to the next slide, we can see the code that is generated. This is not the slide no, I was expecting. This is, this is for a, a, another example of what you might write for um, something like Flex, which is a lexer generator, if we want to identify uh, you know, identifiers and numbers and skip over white space and give errors out. And you can see, like, this is starting to look a little bit ugly. Um, as you get more and more complicated, these things get harder to maintain, harder to understand, harder to debug. And we'll talk a bit more about you know, handwritten versus generated later. One thing you do notice in this code is that we have stirred up an A2I. Most of these uh, Lexa generators are aimed at C programming, which means that if you try to use them in C++, they will have a whole lot of corner cases that the language of the uh, tool will not handle just by virtue of not being targeted at C++. Yep. So now that we have run our lexer, we've taken our source, and we've generated a sequence of tokens. Now we want to generate what's known as an abstract syntax tree. And for that, we need a parser. So this is what we ended up with from our last stage, our series of tokens. And we want to have some way of expressing how this language should look. How should we parse this? What do things mean? And this comes back to the grammar question. So this is how you express what's known as a grammar. Um, well, this is the, the main way that people express grammars uh, using extended back as nor form. So we've described extended back as nor form using extended back as nor form. So we have a definition, and a definition is made up of a name and a double colon equals and a body. And if we want to define something, we define something in terms of the parts that make it. Then we want to have repetition. We represent that by an opening brace, something in between it, and a closing uh, curly brace. If we have an optional thing, we have a stray brackets around it. And the result is a flexible language for grammars. Or a very flexible language for grammars. Or just a flexible language. So you can see how we could take these um, like primitive constructs and represent how some language should look and what we should, what fits in with our language. Like you could not have a somewhat flexible language for grammars. That, that does not make sense for what we've defined here. It has to fit in with the grammar as we've defined it. So let's define a simple grammar for basically just our hello world program. So we have a type, we have a function definition, we have a statement that has an expression, we have an expression that has a couple of variants, there's more. We have a name that is an ID of some sort. Yeah. Don't We're worry. We're going to... in all to all, into all the details because there's way more complication in C++, especially if you get into those corner cases that we are not getting into. So taking this and trying to parse our a sequence of tokens into a, a tree, we start by first recognizing that the main uh, and int, they are IDs. And we can parse those to be a type and a name. 
So we recognize these as being a type, name. The second one is also a name. And we mark that. And we repeatedly apply the same kind of transformations, looking at one of the rules and applying it to transform it into a complete parse tree, which we've for simplicity done in one go. So in this case, we've parsed it to be a function. It has no arguments. It has a statement, which is an expression that has a function call. It has an expression. This is basically applying the parsing. Yep, and then if we kind of take this thing which we built up by uh, recognizing all our rules and pushing things across and kind of turn it on its side, then, hey, it looks like a tree. So this is an abstract syntax tree. We have a function at the top, and we have some information about it, like its return type, its name, its arguments, um, and all the statements which make it up. And that statement is just one call expression which has a name and some arguments. So at this point, our compiler has a much higher level understanding of what our code does. It's no longer a sequence of tokens. It's a function definition. And in the function definition, we have a function call. So we're talking about the constructs that we have in the actual language at this point. Yep. So by now, the compiler has not just looked at our program as some text and done some like random manipulations on it. It's actually understanding how our language operates and what it looks like, how, what the structure of our language is. So if we want to implement one of these, again, we could use some kind of generator. This is Antler. Um, so this is a selection statement. You know, It can either be an if with an else, or an if without an else, or it can be a switch. And this is actually taken from a real um, Antler grammar for C. So you could actually do this and generate like a C parser using tooling like this. We could also do it by hand and say, OK, this is a function which is going to parse a selection statement from you know, some context. And you know, I'm going to look at my next token, and I'm going to check if it's an if. And if it is an if, then we're going to like parse the condition within the parentheses. And then we're going to parse the statement for what you do if the if is true. And then we'll return because we ran out of space. And you know there would be an else, and there would be a switch, and you would do some error handling. But this is the gist of it. And this is called a recursive descent parser. The reason being, you know, we, we have this. We're currently parsing a selection statement. And as part of that, we're going to parse our statement, which is within the, the if braces. And maybe that has another if in it, or it has a switch statement. So this kind of trickles down, and we have a bunch of recursive calls, which are parsing our, um, our program. And so this is, uh, this is how I like to write most of my parsers. Uh, I think you're the same. I definitely like, like to write them by hand. There are parser generators, and they can take in the uh, EBNF grammar that we have. And they have some advantages. And most importantly, they allow you to check your grammar. Because grammars can be ambiguous and they can be complicatedly wrong. So the handwritten ones are really easy to handle errors in. They are really easy to debug because it's just some C++ code. We know how to deal with C debugging C++ code. And they can be more powerful than the automated ones in some corner cases. But the biggest thing about the generator is it does check your grammar. Because did anybody notice an ambiguity we just had? To go back to the code that we have, we have an if. And we have one without an else statement. We have one with an else statement. What if we take the if, the second one, and in the statement, we place one with an else statement? Or vice versa, we take one with an else statement, and in that statement, place one without the else statement. Both of those will result in the exact same sequence of tokens, which means we have two ways of looking at this. So we have an if statement, if A, then if B, then put something else, put something else. But which of these does the else tie to? So this is what we call an ambiguity in the grammar. And it means that actually both of those would be a valid program. But the code doesn't allow us to parse both, because we have to just make a choice in the parser which of these is going to be. And if you use a parser generator, it will tell you, you've got a parse problem here. And this is how your language is ambiguous. Please modify your language if you're not implementing C or C++. Yeah, so my, my personal recommendation would be if you're wanting to write a parser, use a tool to make sure that your grammar is good, and then write it by hand, because then you get most of the benefits of both. It can take some more time, but yes, Jason? Can I recommend a tool? I would recommend Antler. Antler has a, 
Um, really good tooling built around it. it has an IDE called Antlerworks, which will give you like a representation of your grammar, and uh, you can really like understand what's going on when you have some ambiguity. A N T L R, all caps. Okay, so now we have our AST, and we're going to do semantic analysis. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this because this is very much tied to specifics of the language, and um, it's not as interesting as some other parts. So um, this program, if you look at it, like, does it does it make sense? Is it doing anything? I mean, it's it's a valid program, and it would it would compile. It wouldn't do anything, but the syntax is okay, and you know, Watt can um, initialize this s, which has a deduced initial a deduced type. But then what about if we change it to this? It's syntactically pretty much the same. You know, we just changed auto to int. These are both just identifiers. So syntactically, it's the same thing, but it doesn't make sense. This is in an invalid program because you cannot initialize an int with a, um, character, a string literal. So this has to do with understanding the semantics of our program, not not just the syntax. We need to be able to say these types don't match. This is an invalid program. So, so this you, is the point where we take the idea of having an int or an auto and interpreting what it actually means for the variable i to be auto or int, and for the assignment to assign from one side to the other to do type checking, to do conversion checking, to apply automatic conversions. That kind of stuff happens during semantic analysis. And yep. at this point, we would be looking at this program seeing a conversion from a character pointer to an int and complaining that this is invalid, even though everything up to this point is completely fine. Yep, so that's all we're going to look at for semantic analysis. But the idea is we're understanding the semantics of a program. We're going to be like annotating things in our AST so that later on down the trail, we have an easier time. So at the end of semantic analysis, we've maybe told the programmer they've done something silly. We've made some annotations so that um, code generation is easier. And so we move on to generating our intermediate representation. But first, I want to talk a bit about like why would you have an intermediate representation? Why can't we just go from, you know, we have an AST, and then I'm just going to generate x86 from it? So a really good reason is, say you have three source languages, C++, Rust, Swift. And you want to write compilers from C++ to x86, Rust to x86, C++ to ARM, all of those combinations. If you want to do that, then you essentially have to do write all of these compilers. And this is a lot of compilers. And then as soon as you add another source language or you add another target language, then it becomes even more unwieldy. So we don't want to duplicate all of this work. So what we can do is we can replace the entire middle bit by introducing an intermediate representation, which we call IR. And if we do that, we can make all of our front ends uh, compile something to IR, which is powerful enough to capture all the semantic details of our front end languages. So it needs to be a fairly complicated language. And then we make a back end that compiles from IR to any of our target platforms. And adding a new target platform is just a single implementation. Adding a new compiling language is a single implementation. Yep. And the best thing about this is that we all benefit. So if someone from the Rust community says, oh, hey, I want to write an optimization for x86, um, if we're using the same IR and the same backend, then the C++ community benefits because we're using all the same tooling at the end of the day. So this is a really great way to build uh, like cross-language infrastructure. And that's essentially what LLVM is. Yep. So LLVM has the entire backend and intermediate parts. And they expose the intermediate representation to other tools to output. So we have Clang as a front end transforming C into intermediate representation, uh, so LLVM IR. And then the LLVM backend suite of all the things they can target compiled into the same executable, giving us a compiler that compiles C to anything. Holy, well, take a picture. <laughs> Thanks. OK, so this was our AST before we turned on its side but we're going to leave it in this form because we're going to do some more transformations. Let's so, first get rid of the arguments, because we have parentheses and there's no arguments. So we can just leave that out. 
And then we start to transform this from a AST representation into more of an IR implementation. So we don't want the function annotation at the top with the end in the main. We just call it a function called main. We keep the braces because those are actually really important still. And in this, we have a statement. And it's a fairly complicated statement, which we don't like in IR. We want it to be simple statements. So we take the deepest expression, so the string, and we extract it out into a, se a separate uh, assignment. So we take R0, a random name that we invented, and we call this uh, the string hello world. And we replace the use of it in the other part. And then we take out the function call. And at the end, we keep a statement that has just a semicolon behind it. So it's expression semicolon. An expression semicolon basically means that this is an expression result that we don't care about. So we'll just discard that. Oh, throw one off. Yeah, there we go. There we go. You can go two back. So from the top, we take R0, which was an expression to uh, convert to a string, and we just convert it to the string because there's no processing happening. R1 is calling a function. So we take that from the tree form, and we take it into the, the IR form, so call puts with R0's result. And then we take the statement and well, it does nothing. So we convert it to, into a discard and then discard it because it doesn't do anything. So then we have an L brace and an R brace, which is the start and the end of a function. And we replace those with the creation and the destruction of our stack frame, which is basically the function uh, location on the stack. And at this point, we're basically there. Yep, so if you, this is not, LLVM IR, but if you, you can go on Compiler Explorer, thanks, Matt, and uh, check out the LLVM IR, and it would look like a little bit more complicated than this, but you could see how this is kind of equivalent. So now we have gone from our preprocessed source, and we've generated IR, so we're ready to do some optimizations. Now, essentially, any optimization uh, has to be informed by some analysis. So this is a common pattern. We, take some, we do some analysis on our program, and then we can use the data we've collected through this analysis to do optimizations. And maybe some, like some set of optimizations will use the same bit of analysis. Um, so we'll go, I'll get, uh, I will talk about one kind of analysis and one kind of optimization, just to give you a kind of flavor. Um, and I'll talk about liveness analysis. So the idea of this is you want to know when a variable is live or when we're actually using it. Because you know we might have some variable which is scoped right up the top of some function, and we use it right on the line after. But then there's a whole function where we just never use this variable. So it's, it's not live. And we want to use this because this can inform some optimizations. So what we essentially do is we look at our program as a sequence of assignments and function calls or uses. And then we kind of split these out. So the, the terms you might see in the um, in literature is defs and uses. So a assignment is defining uh, a new value for this variable. And a use is like reading the value or passing it to a function or something like that. So dead store elimination is one thing which we use liveness analysis. If we do liveness analysis on this program, we will see that E is assigned to right at the top, but then we never ever use it. So there's no point ever doing that store because no one's going to read from it. So we may as well just get rid of it. So this is an example of you know, doing some analysis, using that to inform optimization. We'll also use liveness analysis later when we talk about register allocation. So that's all we'll talk about, about optimizations. Um, it's a huge field. Come talk to us at the end if you want to know more. Yep. There's entire people still getting PhDs in this field. So it's a really, really big field. Yep. So now we're on to the back end. We have our optimized IR. And we want to generate assembly for this. So this is kind of similar to how we transformed our AST to IR. We're now transforming our IR to assembly. And this has some stages. So these stages are not necessarily done one after another. Some compilers will do them at different times or um, do, multiple, do one stage multiple times. But we'll just talk about these in turn for simplicity. So first of all, the instruction selection. The idea of this is you know, we have some code. Say it's this C code, which just has a couple of int pointers and adds them together, stores them into the first one. 
So we want to take this code and generate some instructions which do the same thing. So first we'll take the IR, which is just more explicit. You know, we're loading from B0, loading from B1, adding the results and storing them back. So there are a couple of main ways in which we can generate instructions. One is macro expansion. And the idea of this is for every IR instruction, we're going to generate some sequence of assembly instructions which do the same thing. So in this example, you know, all of our instructions map to just one assembly instruction, but it could be more. Uh, but then the problem is that this is not necessarily the most optimal way of generating these instructions. We might have um, simpler instructions which will do this more efficiently. So after macro expansion, we have to do what's called peephole optimization, which is considering like small windows of instructions and trying to optimize them, collapse them down to simpler instructions or more efficient ones. And this is how we kind of go from our IR to a reasonably efficient um, series of instructions at the end. Another way, which is what LLVM uses, is uh, selection DAG. So what this does is we look at our, our IR as a kind of directed acyclic graph like this. So we're storing into V0 the result of adding those two loads. And what we do is we have some kind of tiles which we know match single instructions. So we say, we look at this pattern, we say, oh, hey, I know this pattern. If I'm loading from somewhere and adding into that same place, I can do that in one instruction. And then for the last bit, I can do that in one instruction too. So this is, we've taken two different approaches, one kind of just generating a load of mess and then optimizing it down, and the other one trying to come up with the most optimal version right off the bat. And they're not necessarily either like better than one another. In different cases, they have trade-offs. But these are the kind of the main two which we'll see. Next is instruction scheduling. So when we schedule instructions, uh, we tend to uh, think of things as when something is being used and when it's going to be used again. So if you look at this example, we have two additions that depend on the result of the previous one. Then we have, again, two additions where the second addition depends on the one just before it. If we run this on a simple processor, say a Pentium 1, uh, the first instruction would run, and then the second one would be blocked, waiting for it to run. Then the third one can run at the same time, because it can do two things at one time, and then it would be waiting again for the last one. But if we swap the middle two, then we have two instructions that can execute in parallel, and then again two that run in parallel, which means that we did the work of three cycles in two which means that our program became more efficient just by swapping the order of things that we do. Now, this example is a bit simplified, and that's why I mentioned Pentium 1, because that's the one on which this still had a result. The Pentium 2 was advanced enough to just see through this and reorder things and run them out of order. And computers nowadays can do this up to two, 300 instructions ahead, which means that this is not quite as important anymore, although with Spectre, this might come back in. Spectre is based on speculative execution, and part of what the reordering is, uh, is for is for the speculative execution. Yep. But let's carry on. Yeah, there's plenty of other areas in which instruction scheduling is important for making the most of instruction level parallelism. Um, so if you want to know more, come talk to us at the end again. Register allocation is really interesting. So it's essentially a graph coloring problem. So graph coloring is if we have some graph, we want to color it with some number of colors such that no two of the same are adjacent. So we, we couldn't color this all with one color because you know if we made everything green, then there are two greens next to each other, and that's against the rules. Um, we could color this with five colors. You know, Each node is a se separate color. But we want to do it with the smallest number of colors we can. So in this example, we could use two colors. You know, two, there are never two greens which are touching each other, or two bluey purple things, depending what screen you're looking at. Um, so this is a minimal coloring of this graph. You cannot get better than this. So for register allocation, we build up this graph by using liveness analysis. So this is on the left. 
um, you can see the example we had before of all of the uses and defines. And using the liveness analysis data, we see, OK, well, A and B have to be alive at the same time. So do A and C and C and D. So we join anything which has to be alive at the same time with an edge. And now it's a graph coloring problem. We just need to work out um, how to color this graph with the minimal number of colors. And that's how many registers we can use. So we can color this with two colors, which means we only need two registers. This on the right is the same kind of code, but we've just changed the variables for registers. So we're doing the same amount of work, but using less space. If uh, we did a very, very small change on the left side, so we swap the use of A and the definition of D, at that point, we would be changing the graph, so we need an edge between A and D. And if we could do that, we can no longer color it with just two colors because there is a triangle in there. And D is only colorable by a color that is not green and not blue. So we've made it orange for we need a third color. Yeah. And say, say you have a machine which only has two registers. Well, now we have a problem because we can't use three registers. We only have two. And this is where register spilling comes in. So the spilling is what's referred to when you, you know, you need some number of registers live at some given point, but you don't actually have that many registers. So you need to take those values and put them on the stack and then load them back and forth. So the, the basics of register allocation is graph coloring, but then you need to take into account, like, what's the cost of spilling this variable versus this one? So there's a bunch of other analysis which complicates things. But at its basis, this is what's going on. Target specific optimizations. So when we talked about um, the IR optimization in the middle end, that was all target independent optimizations, i.e. no matter whether we're targeting MIPS or x86 or some virtual machine, uh, our optimizations are valid. So in this case, we're going to be targeting x86 because it's the most interesting one for this. If we have a simple instruction, say set this register to zero, on a MIPS, it would be 32 bits, no matter how you encode it, because it just has 32-bit instructions. x86 has variable length instructions, which means we can play around. So we're trying to set a 64-bit register to 0, and we can do that by just moving the literal value 0 into a register, which on x86 is a single byte opcode with 4 bytes of zeros. And 5 bytes is a lot of space. I mean, that's completely wasteful. Who here has 5 bytes to waste? Repeat it a million times through your program, of course. Because we're the compiler, we, we get to do this, these things a lot. But we can do better, because if we look at setting something to 0, if I take a register and XOR it with itself, that results in the value 0. So I can take an XOR of RAX and RAX and use that. Good job. We've saved it down to 3 bytes. So we have a two byte op, uh, one byte opcode saying this is an XOR, one byte saying take these two registers, and one byte saying that we want the 64-bit version because we need to clear 64 bits. But x86 x x has another trick up its sleeve because we don't need to clean the top 32 bits. If we just XOR the bottom 30, uh, 32 bits, it will set the top to zero. So for people who don't know, what's the relationship between EAX and RAX? So RAX is a 64-bit version of a register that is where the 32-bit version is called EAX. So this is essentially referring to the same register. And in this case, we can skip the byte at the, at the front and actually just clear the bottom 32 bits. But because of its quirk, and we know this because we're doing target-specific optimization, we just get the same results in two bytes. So we just made your million setting something to zero things like three million bytes smaller. There you go. So these are the kind of target-specific optimizations which go on, of course, because there's a wealth of hardware out there, and each bit of hardware is different. There is a wide range of things. But this is the kind of thing. You, know, you use information you know about weird things in your architecture to make things faster. OK, assembly output. So this is, again, our IR. So let's take the program and make it into assembly. Let's first start by looking at a string. Uh, strings are big, and we can't just put that in the middle of an instruction. So let's take the string and move it somewhere else. So we now have something called a dot string, which is some section of memory. We call it hello because it's a nice name for it. And we move the offset of that into R0. Then we have a call. And we'll, we'll just transform that into using an actual register. So we use RDI for that because it's the implicit first argument. 
the call is now having an implicit argument, so we don't need to mention that anymore. And the offset of hello has to then go in RDI. We get a result into R1. And well, we don't really care about that. So let's just remove that, remove the implicit argument. We have a call puts. We have a mock RDI. We just have stack frame. So to set up a stack frame, we want to basically just align the stack because we have no local variables. So setting it up is removing 8 from the stack pointer to make it aligned. And getting it back is adding 8 back in. Then we just have return 0 that is not valid assembly yet. And returning 0 means clearing a register. So there's our, our XOR and a return statement. And if we condense this down just a little bit, we can put a gobble link that does exactly this. So everything we've told you up to, up to this point, including all the transformations on the code, result in exactly this output in assembly. Yeah, so this is actually what your compiler is doing. Like We didn't sugarcoat things. And we're almost to the point where you can run this. Because this is assembly, and we can't run assembly, we have to put it through a linker. So we take this stuff. We have some Hello World. We just transform it into the bytes of Hello World. And we have some assembly code that we'll just transform into the bytes corresponding to it. With a caveat, because we don't actually know where hello and puts are. So there's question marks. We can't put question marks in binary. This doesn't work that way. So we'll just mark them as red for now and just say the first one has to be hello and the second one has to be puts. And just keep that in mind. So let's move everything to the left and drop the assembly code. We don't need that anymore. This encodes all the stuff that our computer is going to see. And we have something in red. And we need to somehow encode in our object file that says, this is hello, and that is puts. And we call that a relocation. And the relocation basically says, these four bytes need to be pointed to wherever hello ended up, and these four bytes need to be pointed to wherever puts en ended up. So we'll put those, uh, we'll move this into the sections they are supposed to be in, and then add our relocations just below that. So you have one relocation saying, at this point, put the, uh, the value of hello. At this point, put the value of puts. So now we have encoded that in bytes, so we can leave out the red annotation. And then we make a symbol table that says we have hello here, we have our main here, and we have, we know that puts exist, but we don't know where it is. And at this point, we're done. This is an object file, and it has an unresolved external reference, which, well, we just don't know. We'll just put it in as undefined. So we'll take this, dump it into an elf file. We're not going into details on elf at this point. We'll just ship it on to the linker. Yep, so that was generating our object file, but now we have an unresolved symbol of puts, and we have to work out where this is. So we know where puts lives. You know, we have libc pretty much everywhere, mostly. Uh, so we can just you know, chuck libc into our .txt section. Let's do that. Um, so now we know where puts lives, because you know, libc has a simple table, and we can just chuck that into ours. So now we, we know where puts is, and we know where hello is going to be relative to um, you know, where this thing is loaded. So we just need to kind of say, oh, we're going to say we're going to be loaded at 8048000, just as a, a convention. So we say, OK, I'm going to be loaded at this address. So now I know where everything is going to be at runtime. So I can say, do some maths and say, oh, hey, hello is going to be here, and puts is going to be here. So I can just take these values and patch them in to, uh, to the binary. And that is essentially fulfilling our relocation. We had a relocation which tells us, hey, do this thing, please. And we just fulfilled it. So now the relocations have no value anymore. The symbols other than main have no value because we just need main. And we need all the bytes in sequence at that address. And this is our executable, but we need to tell it somehow how to load it and where to jump. So we add a program header that says, this is the bytes to load. Put them there. And when you start, entry point is this. Yep, so at this point, we actually have, like this is in hex. But if you just put this into binary, this would be a legitimate executable um, as long as it, you know, it was in elf format and stuff. But this is exactly what would be in that executable. So, so if we ran it, it would we say, would get, hello, hello world. world. So we took 166 slides to get to Hello World. I'm very pleased. Right. Hey, we did faster than last time. Last time this was 90 minutes. So I think we're below 90 at this point. Yeah, we've got 10 so, minutes left. Let's excellent. go. So Hello World in C++, we have stood C out because we need C out. We have IO stream included because we need that. And we shove Hello World into it. 
Yep, so we're not going to talk about the preprocessor because the differences aren't very interesting. The compiler, there's some interesting differences. One is to C out. You know, people use this, like, first program they write in C++. Surely it must be simple. Oh, no. It looks like this. This is your C out object as the compiler sees it. And you'll notice there's virtual bases. There's a whole lot of complexity in this. Stream bus, locales. Yeah. Yeesh. Don't try and read it. It's just notice it's a mess. Yeah. Not just reading it. Just don't use it. Because we have something way better. We have format lib. So use format lib. Yeah, it's in C20. Look into it. It's nice. Yeah, well, then we'll, we'll call it std format. Yeah, OK, so we'll look at something a bit simpler. If we have a weird int, which is just stores an integer and has some virtual function, which is going to get its value, uh, we need this because reasons. And this is what it looks like. So we have a feed table pointer. We have an int. We can transform that into an object graph, and that will look like this. Yeah. Oops. So we have a feed table pointer, and the feed table pointer points to the feed table. And the vtable has a function pointer which points to our function. It has an RTTI pointer pointing to the RTTI information for our object type. That's run type, runtime type information. Yes. And we have an offset to top, which in this case is irrelevant. And this stuff points to the actual function implementation, the RTTI information, and that one points to a string. And in order to make this all work with the linker, because this is C++ concept and we didn't want to modify the linker, we just sort of made these all symbols. So it's just a struct and a struct and a struct and a string. And a function. Yeah, so and this we just is. Give them names, which are horrible. Yeah, this is name mangling in C. You know, we need to come up with unique names for everything so that old linkers work. Um, linkers are terrible. Yeah, so we, we have TV for vtable, TI for RTCI information, TS for the string, and the bottom thing is just the entire name mangled. Yeah, if you want to understand name mangling, we can send you resources. Yes. So you could like, represent all of this in assembly. Uh, again, don't try and read this, I'm just showing you can do it. If you wanted to write an entire C++ class with a virtual function in it, you could do it just by writing all this nonsense assembly. Uh, don't, but you could. It's a terrible idea. I can show you how it works. <laughs> OK, linker. Global initializers. So global initializers are a horrible thing, because they have to be done by the time main starts. So we can't just have main run them. So in order to have this thing be initialized on time for main to be there, we make a global initialization function for just this one thing. So it starts by taking the address and calling the constructor, so just constructed in place. And then we pass the address of the destructor and the object and something called the DSO handle to add exit. Basically saying, well, we construct this, and then when you're done, please add the exit of the program, just destruct it again. So this works, except that now we need something to call that function. So actually, we've been sort of lying for simplicity's sake. We Only didn't actually bit. have main here. We shouldn't have jumped to main as an entry point. We should have jumped to underscore start which is at a magical different address. It also comes from libc somewhere. And underscore start is responsible for taking our code. Can you go to next? Yes. So it starts up all the global initializers, then it runs main, and then it's responsible for doing all the add exit stuff. Yep. So this is how it would actually look. Again, not important exactly what's going on, but it's just calling main and calling our, um, going to result in our exit at exit handler is being called at the end. So this is essentially just doing the whole bootstrapping of running our program. It's basically delegating everything to Lipsy. Lipsy, go handle that. Yep. So again, if we now do all of this, we have a valid C++ executable. And we can run it and get Hello World. So in summary, I hope we have dispelled some of the magic for you. You know, we took our source file, we went to executable through all of these stages. Some of them were more complex than others. But hopefully, you can see this is not magic. This, this is C++. Is C++. Plus. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? We have time for some questions. Five minutes, yes. Yes, go to the microphone, please. Yes, uh, form a queue behind the microphone, and we'll ask questions in order. What about dynamic linking? Dynamic linking we originally had in the talk, and sadly we had to strip it out because it wouldn't fit in time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you want to know about dynamic linking, come talk to us. <laughs> yes. We originally had requested a two-hour slot, and we didn't get a two-hour slot, so we had to strip a whole lot of material. We simplified the compiler part, and we just completely removed shared libraries. Yeah. I think they thought two hours was too long for Hello World. It's not. Yeah. But <laughs> we're still tight. Yeah. Next question. 
you mentioned target specific optimizations. Yes. Uh, some of the languages that you mentioned, Swift, Rust, have come online since the IR was defined. Has the IR been being refined to accommodate the special properties of those languages, or so the, are there target specific optimizations? So the question is, is the IR modified to uh, accommodate Rust and Swift and other languages, or uh, was this handled in a different way? It's definitely been expanded a lot. Rust, for example, has a borrow mechanic, which we want to represent in the IR, and C++ doesn't have a way to make it, which means that the IR can represent some things that can only come from Rust and some things that can only come from C++. And depending on how your backend optimizations work exactly, some of those may only trigger for Rust, which means that the stuff that Rust is doing for making the backend better may or may not benefit us in C++, but most likely will. Yeah, there's also things like um, this trickles down into debug information as well. You know, like uh, Dwarf 5, I think, added um, support for um, talking about template, uh, variadic templates. And that's something which had to be added to the debug information format because of what higher level languages were doing. So in other words, this can be handled in the back end. It doesn't, we don't need to have optimizations in the front end or something. Uh, well, no, some, some optimizations are done in the front end if the front end knows more about them at that level. Yeah. You Thank typically you. try to keep all, keep all the optimizations in the back end because then they apply to everything. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Uh, sometimes uh, if you want to do a, a call to the kernel or something different, you have to use different instructions. How this is represented on the on the object file or... So you mean if you're, if you're doing syscalls? Yes. Yes. Um, I mean, syscalls, most of the ones which, which we would do are just implemented in libc, and they do all the magic for us. If you are doing something really complicated, they will be represented as the actual instruction, I think, at that point. Uh, it will be treated equivalent to inline assembly, because effectively that's what you're doing. Yeah. And my question is uh, how... If you would want to replace the, I think, I don't know, sure, I think it's called the backend. So the thing that actually generates the uh, target specific instructions from IR, um, how would it work if you have a very restricted, let's say, 80s CPU and it runs out of registers? That would be exactly the registers billing situation that we uh, described. Yes. So uh, uh, is that in, um, is there a situation where that can lead to? not compiling stuff, or we'll just keep spilling until it somehow resolves. Right. So yeah, so essentially there, are, for a given target architecture, um, it may be impossible to compile what you've asked for. Um, I mean, you if you if your target arch architecture says it supports C or C++, then for like within reasonable limits, which are defined in the standard, um, it has to be able to um, to run these things, but for especially like um, you know like embedded dialects of C and things like that, where you know it's not quite standard, um, then you might get into the situation where you cannot lower um, your actual program because you know you don't have enough space. This especially happens on like GPUs and things like that. Like if you don't have enough space on your chip, then like what can you do? <laughs> In terms of space, that is a really big limitation. In terms of registers, there's actually a proof that it can happen uh, that you, you can never have too little. If you consider a machine that has zero registers and just has to load everything from stack every time it tries to run something, run a single instruction, store everything to the stack, that is exactly what the original Java virtual machine is. Which means that everything that can be represented in Java, which is pretty much any kind of software, can be run on a zero register machine. So less than zero is, I think, uh, impossible to define. So it, everything is possible with zero. Thank you. A great talk, by the way. Thank you. And Thank you. we're out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you.